I'm Sylvia Peterson Perry, and um, we have an exciting day of talks planned for you all. Um, and like Dr. Brown said, I'm going to start by talking about the state of substance use in the USA and give updates in epidemiology, the impact of COVID-19, and public policy. Hopefully this talk will help frame the day and get you all excited for the rest of the topics that we will cover today. Um, so session overview briefly, we'll talk about some epidemiology, we'll look at national trends and then Seattle specific trends. We'll talk about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll go through some policy updates and some highlights, including some exciting news about drug decriminalization in Oregon and Washington, talk about buprenorphine expansion, and then look a little bit ahead towards what's on the horizon. Um, and so our learning objectives correlate nicely with this. We'll review current trends in substance use, understand the impact of these changing trends on the provision of primary care, um, understand the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on these patterns and policies, review evolutions in public policy regarding substance use, and then hopefully apply for a buprenorphine X waiver if you are eligible and not yet wavered. So I wanted to start by um, putting into perspective the scale of substance use in our country, who uses. Um, and so this is some data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, and it's reporting the percentage of our population who reports, quote, illicit drug use um, by age range. Um, and the, the take home from this is that it's actually very common for folks to use illicit drugs. Um, substance use in this country is not just a story of folks with substance use disorder. Um, this data shows that in terms of lifetime use for all folks 12 and older, um, just about half have ever used illicit drugs. Um, this number is a little bit lower for teens and then slightly higher for those in the 18 to 25 age range. Um, and so I think that that's a very interesting perspective. Um, and then the, the different columns, so there's lifetime use, there's past year use, which is a little bit lower. Um, which is 20% for all folks um, ages 12 and up, um, but almost 40% for those in the 18 to 25 age range, um, with 24% have been used in the past month. So this is um, a common situation. Um, there's data on what folks use. Uh, this is slightly different categories than that illicit drug use category that they were using. This is any substances. So as you can see, alcohol is included in this. Um, and alcohol being sort of the, the most common substance to have been used during the lifetime. Um, and then you can see the next most common is marijuana. And then sort of much less common are things like hallucinogens, cocaine. Um, and I was surprised to see that substances like methamphetamine um, and heroin were, were much, much lower um, and was wondering whether like the methods or stigma might be relating to that lower than I expected um, percentage of folks using those substances. Um, we are gonna see in some of our upcoming data that there's like increasing use of meth and, and so we'll see how that plays into this in the future. We also have data on um, trends among youth. Um, so this is from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and they were looking specifically at youth. This data is for 12th graders um, and it's for use of, again, quote, illicit drugs in the past year. Um, and they broke it down by drug type. So for any illicit drug use, 38% of our 12th graders have used in the past year. Um, however, if you exclude marijuana from that, it drops dramatically to 11.5%. Um, so um, with, with the sort of next comment, most common after marijuana being LSD, synthetic cannabinoids and cocaine. Um, and then again, we can see the opiates are actually very low in this. Um, looking even younger, um, this is a slightly different category again, substance misuse among eighth graders. And so they were looking specifically at cough medicine, amphetamines and inhalants. Um, overall, we can see that the rates of substance misuse among eighth graders has been trending upwards um, with 6% of eighth graders using inhalants, 5% misusing amphetamines and 4.6% misusing cough medicine.
Um, so I think this is a, a very important slide and something that is probably not new information for folks, but big picture, um, the scale of the problem is escalating and sort of the most dramatic measure of that is about overdose deaths. Um, so this data starts in 1999 and goes through 2019. Um, and there's a very dramatic rise in overdose deaths. Um, you can see that, that the sort of lines within the bar graphs, um, this data has been broken down by gender um, using the categories male and female. Um, and you can see that it's sort of um, impacting those in the male category more than those in the female category, um, but sort of trending up for both categories. Um, looking specifically at which agents are involved in the overdose deaths is important. And um, uh, you can see a very dramatic increase in the orange line here, um, which is synthetic opiates other than methadone. And, and that's primarily fentanyl. Um, I think this holds true with patterns that many of us are seeing in practice. And we're gonna also look at some Seattle specific data um, that corroborates this pattern. Um, and then also interestingly is there's been a less dramatic but still quite notable rise in um, psychostimulants with abuse potential is what they're calling it, which is primarily methamphetamine. Um, and has had a rapid rise in recent years from very little to, to sort of competing right up there with um, like prescription opiates or opioids. Um, and then we also see an increase in cocaine in overdose deaths. Um, and interestingly, a slight downtrend in benzos and prescription opioids. Um, and we will learn more about um, some of the impacts of methamphetamines and some of these other substances in upcoming talks. So in terms of sequelae, so many of us are familiar with the sequelae of, of this issue in our own communities, among our patients, and for some of us in our personal lives. Um, the National Institute of Drug Use and Health sort of has their own items that they pull out in terms of, of important sequelae. They note that drug use costs the US $700 billion annually um, in increased healthcare costs, crime, and lost productivity. They note the spread of infectious disease such as HIV and Hep C, deaths due to overdose as we just discussed, um, the effects on communities and families and mass incarceration. Um, and then they quote, crime, unemployment, domestic abuse, family dissolution, and homelessness. So we um, can look at some Seattle specific trends. And so um, we're, we're fortunate that Seattle is one of 12 national drug early warning system sentinel community sites. Um, and so there's 12 communities across the country that they use as sort of areas where they collect extra data um, in drug use patterns and trends using a variety of indicators. Um, and so those indicators are drug overdose deaths, treatment admissions, hospital cases, poison center exposure calls, and law enforcement seizures. Um, and so it, it, allows, it allows them to come up with, like identify emerging drugs and changing drug trends. So we can look at some very local data, which is helpful for many of us who are in the Seattle area. Um, so you can see this, the red line in terms of drugs involved in overdose deaths is actually methamphetamine, which is significantly on the rise. Um, we're also seeing fentanyl, benzos, and alcohol trending upwards, um, and oxycodone and cannabis decreasing. Heroin has been high, it's stayed high, um, as, as have prescription opioids. Um, and interestingly, this dramatic rise in methamphetamine is sort of a West Coast phenomenon. Um, so all four of the Western Sentinel sites reported increases in methamphetamine-associated deaths in 2019. Um, they also show us um, inpatient treatment admissions, which can be helpful um, in looking what's happening with patterns in our community. This is sort of the same data presented twice. Um, on the left is absolute numbers of admissions, um, of publicly funded admissions, and on the right is percentages. Um, so you can see alcohol is sort of our highest, both, both in absolute numbers and also um, in percentage, followed by heroin and then meth, marijuana, and cocaine and prescription opioids at the bottom. Um, 
we're able to see uh, Medicaid claims for addiction treatment medications within King County. Um, and this is actually really good news. So good job, Seattle providers. Uh, you can see just a really nice climb in our prescriptions for your buprenorphine, um, which is treatment for opioid use disorder. And then naltrexone, which is used for either opioid or alcohol use disorder, also increasing, um, but at a less dramatic clip. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, we will preview how to get your X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine if you don't have it already. And then we'll have several talks later today about um, prescribing buprenorphine. So hopefully we can get everybody on board to, to maybe start doing that if you're not already. Um, so hopefully that data gave us a nice overview of the, of the magnitude of the problem and, and the ways in which it's specifically impacting the Seattle community. Um, I think it's always really interesting to think about how the data on the national level and then also on the local level sort of aligns or doesn't with your clinical experience. Um, I have some brief comedic relief. This is the drug policy version of the um, XKCD comic meme that some of you have probably seen on the internet. Um, so quick break with that. Um, and then we're going to look um, more specifically into how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted these trends. Um, and this is something that a lot of people have been thinking about, talking about, hypothesizing about. Um, Dr. Nora Volko is the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse uh, with the NIH. And she recently presented some data around this question. Um, she reported that methamphetamine overdose deaths increased 46% from 2019 to 2020. That aligns with that really steep line that we saw on the earlier graphs. Cocaine overdose deaths went up 30%. There was a dramatic increase in alcohol sales, an increase in cannabis revenue in states where cannabis is legal. Um, and then also of note, patients with substance use disorder were both more likely to contract COVID-19 and also have worse outcomes in terms of mortality. Um, and there's a big question that goes along with this, which is why, why did this happen? Why did we see these patterns? Um, there's been, several articles published hypothesizing and theorizing on this topic. I would assume that we're gonna see a lot more publications um, addressing this in the coming months and years, um, but some, some uh, issues that have been cited in, in some of the stuff that's been published already um, includes things like economic stress, loneliness, anxiety, decreased access to services, and then also decreased access to resiliency, resiliency promoting activities. As, as some of the reasons why we've seen those dramatic rises. Um, Dr. Stoops, who's a PhD at the University of Kentucky, recently published um, on this very question and wrote that there's a sort of perfect storm of factors that we know increase drug use. People are more stressed and isolated, so they make unhealthy decisions, including drinking more and taking drugs. So one, one hypothesis. Um, one thing that's interesting about the pandemic um, and about our like data collection in terms of these trends is it's actually pretty challenging to see the full effect due to the way that the CDC typically records this data. So they typically record enrolling 12 month sums, which can mask spikes um, on the more granular level, like what we would hope to see um, when looking at the pandemic, which is sort of like more of a month by month situation for at least parts of it. Um, however, Friedman and Aker um, just recently in February, po published um, a study called COVID-19 and the Drug Overdose Crisis, where they developed a technique to estimate monthly totals for overdose or overdose mortality um, to try to like un unmask those spikes. And they found that the deadliest month on record was May of 2020. So just a few months into the pandemic, they found that um, just over 9,000 people died from drug overdose deaths, um, and that that was a 58% increase from the year prior. Um, they noted that most states saw high magnitude increases, but the highest were in West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. There were some policy changes that came along with this too, and many of you are probably familiar with this. Um, it became easier to get take-home doses of methadone um, since uh, March 17th of 2020. Uh, there's pros and cons associated with this. We're going to hear more about methadone clinics later today. Um, but some of the cons um, are we, we saw potentially increase in unsafe combination of drugs and medications. Um, and then 
hard to say if it's a pro or con, but folks who weren't getting carries before, weren't eligible for carries before, um, were now eligible to get carries. Um, we saw that it was easier to initiate folks on buprenorphine and there were a lot of creative ideas on how to do that. We'll hear more about that later today as well. Um, and then telemedicine was a big change also. We saw improved access to care. Um, we also saw up to a 70% decrease in urine drug testing, um, which came along with an increase in positivity for non-prescribed substances. We will dive more into urine drug testing today also um, in two of our talks, um, but a possible increase in um, potentially dangerous drug combinations is sort of um, the sequelae of that. Um, yeah, so we <laughs> talked a little bit about policy updates, um, but I um, have some exciting sort of more recent policy updates to share with you all. Um, and that's around drug decriminalization. Um, so in November, 2020, um, Oregon voters approved measure 110, 58 to 41%, making Oregon the first state to decriminalize small scale possession of all drugs. These are just some takes from different newspapers around the state on, on the goodness or badness of that decision. Um, and some responses from community leaders on this, um, on this change. So Cassandra Frederick from the Drug Policy Alliance called, said that in a historic paradigm shifting win and arguably the biggest blow to the war on drugs to date, Oregon voters passed measure 110, the nation's first all drug decriminalization measure. Drug possession is the most arrested offense in the United States with one arrest every 23 seconds. Um, and Casey Jama, the executive director of Unite Oregon noted, the reality is that systems of oppression always find different ways of incarcerating black and brown folks. I think the new law is a good step forward. It's one tool we want to remove from their toolbox. Um, so briefly details of the law, um, it turned possession of drugs for personal use into a class E violation, which is the lowest class of violation. It was previously a class A misdemeanor. Um, and so um, folks who were found to be in possession of drugs were given a $100 fine or um, required to do a health assessment or screening for substance use disorder within 45 days. Um, if they were found to have substance use disorder from this screening, there was a voluntary referral to treatment. There was no requirement to enter treatment um, and the violation was dismissed after the assessment. If they don't do the assessment, the unpaid fines won't trigger incarceration or warrants. Um, and those assessments are conducted through addiction recovery centers and include a substance use disorder screening by a certified alcohol and drug counselor. Um, the law also diverted a portion of tax revenue from the cannabis industry that is thriving in Oregon to substance use disorder treatment. Um, and they're anticipating a 91% decrease in convictions for possession. Uh, and then on the right here, you can see the user amounts under measure 110. And they, um, they really are, for some of our patients, like very small amounts. And so um, potentially less than what some of our patients are using on a daily basis. Um, not to be left behind, we have some updates hot off the press from Washington. Um, and um, there was a recent uh, in February Supreme Court decision um, out of Washington State called State versus Blake um, regarding a case in 2016 where Shannon Blake, who's pictured here on the right, was arrested in Spokane and she was convicted of simple drug possession um, because she had she was found to have a baggie of methamphetamine in jeans that she like borrowed from a friend. Um, and so she was convicted for that, even though she states that she did not know that the um, methamphetamine was in the baggie in the jeans. Um, and so this is known as the Blake decision. It found that a felony conviction for unintentional or passive simple possession violates a due process guarantee. Um, and <laughs> in legal terms, it's called innocent non-conduct with no mens rea. Um, so for those of you who wanted to know that, um, and Washington was actually the last state in the nation to throw this out. Um, and so we're still, this is new. Um, we think it will likely be retroactively applicable, but it's still, that's still sort of TBD. There were immediately immediate like results from that. Police across the state were directed to not conduct criminal investigations, arrest, seek search warrants, um, or other things like that for simple possession. Prosecutors were directed to stop ongoing drug possession cases and 
and to seek orders vacating convictions for past cases. Um, the full response to this will likely take years. Um, and interestingly, as a result of this, Washington was briefly left without any laws on the books regarding drug possession. Um, and so to address that, um, our state legislature um, actually had had several bills um, that were being proposed around drug decriminalization, but the one that ended up passing was Senate Bill 5476. Um, from a Democratic senator from Redmond. This was a sort of middle ground compromise bill, reestablished criminal penalties, um, but did also similarly to Oregon require a referral to health evaluation and possible treatment for the first two violations. Um, the legal thresholds were similar to Oregon and then also had some money for substance use disorder treatment. Um, and interestingly, this bill expires in two years. And so, the point is for the legislator to reconsider and reevaluate what's going on. And so just two weeks ago, um, Jay Inslee signed this into law and he said, this is a much more appropriate and successful way to address the needs to underlie drug abuse. This legislation will help reduce the disparate impact of the previous drug possession statute on people of color. It moves the system from responding to possession as a felony to focusing on the behavioral health response. Um, Limit, there's limitations to decriminalization. This is not legalization. It does not make the drug supply safer. It might lay the foundation to expand safe drug checking since you have to briefly um, take a small amount of drugs into, into your own possession to, to test drugs for safety. And it might expand the potential for safe consumption sites, which we'll hear about next from Dr. Wilson. Um, and this is a quote from a person who uses drugs reflecting on his experience with the um, incarceration system around drug possession. And he said, being labeled a felon, I sometimes feel like a second class citizen. Punitive measures aren't effective in addressing this issue. Jail does nothing but worsen the problem. I didn't learn anything of value during my 10 years in jail. I learned nothing but to perfect the crimes I already did. And I learned more crimes to feed my addiction. Um, another exciting buprenorphine update um, is the expanded prescribing. So the new SAMHSA guidelines expanded who can prescribe buprenorphine. They did not X the X waiver. So the X waiver is still a thing. Um, however, you can now get exempted from the eight hour training um, and also from the requirement for provision of psychosocial services. You do need a valid DEA and state medical license. Um, and with this new waiver, you can treat up to 30 patients um, with buprenorphine for opiate use disorder. Um, there's questions about this. What's the implication for emergency department providers who are seeing more than 30 patients annually? Um, um, and then also you need to have an approved notice of intent prior to prescribing. Um, so how to apply? There's a website you go to. Um, so um, if you um, don't have your X waiver, but you are licensed and have a DEA, I recommend that you use this QR code um, or type in this address and go to this website. This is a waiver notification website. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, and basically, this is as far as I get with screenshots, but you enter your medical license number, enter your DEA registration number, um, and then they're going to ask you some questions because I have my X waiver, I couldn't navigate any further. Um, but what you'll want to do is under certification of qualifying criteria, you'll want to select other um, and then enter practice guidelines in the text box. And that's because they haven't updated their options yet. Um, in their computer system for this new regulation. And then you'll need to get your X number from SAMHSA after your application is processed and then include that in your prescription script. Um, and you're, like I said, we're gonna hear a lot more about using buprenorphine in practice. Um, in order to X the X waiver, which is removing the requirement of a special waiver that would take legislative action uh, through the Controlled Substance Act. So write to your legislators if that's something important to you. Um, we'll breeze through this because we're running out of time, but essentially there's access barriers beyond this X waiver prescriber level barriers. Um, there was a secret shopper study that was actually um, is about to be published in print, but was published online that found that 20, up to 20% of pharmacies would not dispense BUP. So we have work to do, not just on the prescriber level, level but on the pharmacy level as well. Um, and then, just some upcoming policy things that hopefully we can look forward to, Xing the X waiver, expanding methadone access, 
reducing stigma among healthcare providers, um, increasing access among incarcerated individuals for substance use disorder treatment, safe consumption sites, and then expanding decriminalization or possibly moving towards legalization. Uh, in conclusion, substance use is very common in this country. It's not limited to substance use disorders. Our national trends are changing. Fentanyl and methamphetamine, especially on the West Coast, are playing a much bigger role. Morbidity and mortality are increasing, especially in the context of COVID-19. Um, we have some very exciting policy changes that are going to have big impacts on our communities. Sign up for your Buprenorphine working waiver. Here's that QR code again. Um, and then stay tuned for an exciting day of talks. Um, and now, um, these are my references, <laughs> but I'm going to leave the QR code up for you all. Oops, or possibly we lost it. Um, but able to take questions if there's any questions. Yeah, so um, the question is around the letter of intent for the buprenorphine um, waiver. And so the it's, it's called a notice of intent. Um, and so the notice of intent is basically filling out this form. Um, and so going to this website and clicking through the buttons, um, so entering your data on this page and then entering practice guidelines under your qualifying criteria certification, um, submitting that is your notice of intent and SAMHSA should get back to you with the X waiver. Again, I was not able to try this out personally, but I've heard from folks who have done it that it is, um, it is doable and, and not that difficult. Um, there's also been some webinars um, that I think you could find by searching online that are relatively short that walk you through it as well. Um, but it, it seems like it's pretty straightforward. That's a really good question. So don't, don't prescribe buprenorphine for opiate use disorder until you have the X waiver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the question is about um, on the pharmacy side, what does it mean when a pharmacy would not dispense buprenorphine? Does that mean they didn't have it, they wouldn't order it? Um, and what are we doing about it? Which I think is a really um, good and important question. Um, and so the way that they did the study was they basically um, tried to like call in um, prescriptions for buprenorphine to, they chose counties that were most impacted by um, opiate use disorder mortality, I think. Um, and then they called one like chain store and one independent pharmacy and then like tried to call in a prescription for buprenorphine. Um, and they were, I think they were just told in 20% that they would not do it. Um, yeah, so it, it means like on the provider level, one, we should be continuing to advocate for, for access for this like safe and life-saving medication. And two, we need to think about that when we're prescribing um, for our folks, especially our folks in like rural communities, which we're doing more and more, um, even out of Seattle with telemedicine, like specifically where we're sending the scripts and um, working with our patients on that. And maybe that even like impacts clinic policies on like refills and, and things like that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Great. Um, well, thank you, everybody. Um, I wanted to introduce our next speaker, who is um, Dr. Lada Wilson, who will be talking about supervised consumption facilities.